Welcome to the Opportunity Zones podcast. I'm Jimmy Atkinson. On November 1st, Novogratic and Company will be hosting the Novogratic 2023 Fall Opportunity Zone Summit in Washington, D.C. Here to discuss that upcoming event, as well as other Opportunity Zone industry updates, are Jason Watkins, principal at Novogratic in Alpharetta, Georgia, and Brent Parker, partner at Novogratic in Long Beach, California. And Brent is also conference chair of the upcoming Fall OZ Summit. Gentlemen, thanks for joining the show. It's great to have both of you here today. Welcome. Oh, really excited to be here, Jimmy. Thanks. Thank you. Absolutely, gentlemen. Uh, Brent, let's turn to you first, uh, just for a kind of a big high level question. I'm sure a lot of my audience of high net worth investors, advisors, other Opportunity Zone stakeholders are, are likely pretty familiar with Novogratic. It's a household name for those in the Opportunity Zones industry. But for anyone who may be new or, or maybe a little bit unfamiliar, can you briefly explain what Novogratic and Company is and some of the services that the firm provides to the Opportunity Zone industry? Sure, sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, we're a full service CPA firm, uh, also valuation with a valuation component. Um, you know, we provide, uh, you know, anything from uh, audits and, uh, and, and tax return preparation, agreed upon procedures engagements, which are obviously important to the um, opportunities or opportunities of incentive uh, industry um, to, you know, consulting, modeling, projections. Uh, and then our valuation side uh, can handle, you know, appraisal and, and valuation components uh, as well. So, yeah, we're so full service. Uh, uh, firm uh, take care of all of your sort of accounting and and uh, you know valuation uh, needs. And then just to kind of uh, promote your firm even a little bit more, I, I'm I'm really impressed with with all of the um, work that the Novogratic Opportunity Zones Working Group does as well. You guys have been in the Opportunity Zones industry since well, honestly, since before it was an industry, right? You guys were. Very involved um, with the with the with the creation of the of the legislation and and the regulations before it was even passed. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And I I, I co lead that that working group with with John Shreddy. And the working group started in 2017, I think, or at least in early. I guess it was 2017. It was it was before the legislation had even passed as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And it's it's been a, a collection of. Uh, attorneys and other professionals, consultants and qualified opportunity funds and businesses that, that get, have gotten together uh, many, many meetings now over the last five, six years. And I think we've really helped to establish a lot of sort of the, the standard accepted practices uh, of how, how folks are doing in the industry. We've been you know, very, I think, important, had an important role in reviewing the proposed regulations of those came out and making comments and suggestions and modifications to those to make the the incentive work more <laughs> to work better i guess you could say um yep. and uh, certainly in the, in the initial rollout phases as well so we i think we've been instrumental and we're still working we're still trying to make it better uh, we still get together monthly and and i think we're we've, we've got some some exciting uh projects in underway right now that hopefully will continue to improve the incentive for everybody uh, it's, it's incredible the work that the working group does. I try to join those monthly calls as often as I can. They're invaluable. Uh, and and there was some breaking news that came out of the last working group call just uh, earlier this week. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, but first, Jason, how would you characterize the overall current state of the Opportunity Zones industry? We're, we're more than five years in now. It's It's no longer a brand new program, but it's still pretty new. What, how would you characterize the current state of it? I agree. At, at times, I feel like it's a maturing industry, but then I constantly read articles that are, what are opportunity zones and how can I use opportunity zones to defer a capital gain? So I feel like there are a lot of investors that are just now becoming aware of it. Uh, but we still have four years before uh, of investment really left, but before uh, the current program is, is scheduled to sunset. And so I think there's still plenty of time for folks to learn. And we, we're all continuing our education process, I think, to uh, to make more folks aware of, of the incentive. As, as far as where it stands now, um, it, it's been a tough year, I think. Um, sort of in a post-COVID environment, interest rates are up. Um, the, the, the stock market has, has been down or at least flat. So there haven't been as many capital gains, I think, that have been realized. And so 
because of that, there haven't been as many capital gains to invest. And I think Brent's going to discuss some of the some of the findings from our, our latest uh, QAF survey that Novogratic publishes on a quarterly basis uh, later later on during during today's uh, podcast. But you know that's sort of what we're seeing, and we're also but on, on the on the flip side of that, we're seeing a lot of investors that have gotten comfortable with with the, the incentive, and so we're seeing a lot of repeat investment. Um, the same folks that are, are creating uh, more gains or at least utilizing capital gains that they're having to make second and third and fourth and fifth investments in, in, into new projects. And so we're still seeing a lot of activity. It's, it's not like this is completely dried up or anything. Uh, activity's down compared to a couple of years ago. Um, but I think a lot of that is more of an overall economic. Um, the, the state of the economy as much as as anything else. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Opportunity zones that has matured as an industry. In theory, investors should be more comfortable now and there should be more capital coming in now than there was previously. But cyclically, the economy is just in a different position than it was a few years ago. And I think that's provided a, 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 an unfortunate headwind for, for all private markets, quite frankly, not just opportunity zones, but opportunity zones are equally affected. I, I, let, let's let's talk about um, the big topic on on a lot of professionals' minds, at least the uh, the the types of people that I talk to, other opportunity zone professional investors, uh, QOF fund managers, deal sponsors. They're all clamoring for an update on hey, what's going on with legislation? Because currently, for those who are unaware, the opportunity zone tax incentive is set to sunset. Um, toward the end of 2026, you have to realize a capital gain by 2026 in order to participate in the program, and then it's going to end, you know, shortly after that time frame. So there has been a lot of push from the industry to extend opportunity zones and to reform it in some ways to make it better. Um, a lot of opportunity zone stakeholders were, quite frankly, frustrated that. The reform and extension legislation that was introduced in the last session of Congress failed to progress. There was no new big tax legislation at the end of last year like we might have hoped and expected. Um, and, but here's the big breaking news. Uh, we are recording this on the morning of September 28th, and just within the last hour or so here, House Resolution 5761 just this morning was referred to the House Committee on Ways and Means officially introduced to to the house uh this week uh Jason I want to get your your take on that what what is the update here on this new reform legislation great and how exciting right that this yes. is actually dropping minutes before we start recording yeah great timing by the way <laughs> to for recording this podcast right I'm glad that Congress scheduled around this podcast that was great um so yeah, this is basically, this is a reintroduction of the Opportunity Zones Transparency Extension and Improvement Act. This is what was introduced in both the House and the Senate. Uh, this is the House version. Uh, they're identical, but, or at least they were in the previous Congress, and we, we expect them to be, uh, if and when the Senate version is is introduced, we expect it to be the same. Uh, this is being introduced by Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania. Um, Mike is... Uh, been very instrumental, I think, as proponent of opportunity zones. He's in Erie, Pennsylvania, which we all are, I think, pretty aware of how successful the OZ incentive has been in Erie. And so Mike has, uh, Representative Kelly has, has introduced, reintroduced this, the, the OZTIA, we call it. And it's expected to be largely the same as the previous version. Um, there will be a few modifications we expect to see. Uh, the two-year extension will st still be there. Uh, but most importantly, I think the originally introduced OSTIA actually had a, a bit of a technical error in that it did not extend the two-year extension to new investment. It was only extended it to previously existing investments. And so as part of a, a sort of a, a project between the Novogratic Opportunity Zones Working Group and Economic Innovation Group, we reviewed the legislation and, and submitted uh, back to um the co-sponsors some some recommendations, including this one that make sure that the correct internal revenue code section is referenced within the legislation so that that two-year extension would apply to new investments, which is really what we wanted to see anyway. Um, and then there are a few other uh, modifications that we had recommended. Um, we had noted that in the previously introduced legislation, 
there's this um, expectation that certain higher income census tracts will be sunsetted as opportunity zones. And the original legislation said that governors had the option to name, to nominate replacement census tracts. And we recommended that be a requirement. So if a census tract just wouldn't go away and, and the, the incentive not be as powerful as it could be. So we did recommend that that be a requirement. Um, we also wanted to make it a requirement that the governors, when they are nominating these replacement tracts, they are communicating with the local uh, CEOs of the jurisdiction in which the, the census tract uh, would, would be located. And another issue we saw with, with the legislation is that it was requiring, um, or it was for what census tracts would be eligible for uh, re to be replacement tracts, there were to be up to 12 months of, of time could pass before uh, regulations would be uh, proposed to that would determine what the criteria would could be for a replacement track. We recommended that that just be part of the legislation to begin with so that we don't have a 12 month wait while we wait for regulations to, to be published as we're all, we're all familiar with the original uh, legisl legislation. It took two years to get the regulations uh, finalized. So we don't, we didn't want to run into that again. Um, we also, as, as you recall from the original bill, there are some reporting requirements because one of the, the big criticisms is that there hasn't really been a way to track uh, the efficacy and, and success of, of the Opportunity Zones incentive uh, because the, the data was lacking. And so there are a number of, of uh, new data points that are going to be required to be reported under this at both the uh, QAF level or at the investor level and also at the QAF level uh, related to the underlying uh, and ultimate in, in use of the proceeds in these in these opportunity zones. And so um, one of the data points that we thought should be added is the number of affordable housing units that are being uh, developed, as well as the number of direct and indirect jobs that are being created with the investments. This would all be self-reported uh, by or at the fund level, but we thought those would be really good data points that can help tell the story of opportunity zones and, and how successful they've been in driving investment into these low income areas, which was the, that was the intent to begin with, drive investment. We far exceeded, I think, the wildest expectations of how much investment would be driven in the opportunity zones to this point, even based on old data, which we don't, I think, we're, are we current through 2020 now, I think is where um, we really know what uh, the IRS is, has or what's been reported to the IRS on tax forms. So it's still old data. It still wildly exceeds what we expected to see. And yeah, then we'll, I was going to say, we'll talk about that data in a more detail in a few minutes here, but but go on. Sure. And then just a couple other things. There are some pretty sort of draconian penalties um, that were there for a failure to, to meet some of these information uh, requests, some of these re new requirements for information. Um, and so our, our comment there is to, try to limit those, especially if they are de minimis or if they're non-numerical in nature. And then lastly, um, there is a fund of funds provision that is in this would be very welcome, I think, to the industry. This will allow a QAF to hold an investment in another QAF. It is It would be required um, to be at a 95% threshold as opposed to the current 90% assets test. So a QAF that invested in another QAF would have to hold at least 95% of its assets and qualify. Um, and our recommendation there was to make sure that it's based on an average uh, of two testing dates, similar to the current 90% test that everybody's familiar with. So that's some of the changes. And we, there might there might be some more. We, there were other sort of more minor modifications that we, we had suggested, but that, that's what we expect to see. And whenever the text is published, uh, it, we're, we're just introduced today. Usually the text follows a few days later. So we'll, we'll be reviewing that when it comes out for Hopefully, all of our uh, suggested modifications happened. Very good. And uh, yes, hopefully, by the time this episode goes live next week, we will have that full text. And I'll make sure I link to that from the show notes page for today's episode. You can find those show notes at opportunitydb.com slash podcast. I'll also link to uh, my summary of the previous legislation that was introduced back in April of 2022. I have got a good summary of the of that bill up on uh, our website. I'll, I'll make sure that I pass that along on the show notes page as well. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to write another uh, <laughs> summary of, of this, this new bill pretty shortly here. Um, Jason, how does this 
opportunity zone legislation fit into the broader context of congressional tax priorities and a potential year-end bill? Because you know, a, a lot of the stakeholders that I talk to, all they really care about is opportunity zones, opportunity zones, opportunity zones. Hey, when are they going to extend this thing? And 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 you know, but looking at it from Congress's point of view, this is a very small piece of a very big and complicated puzzle. So uh, can you help us uh, understand how this fits into the broader context? Sure. I mean, as as we're recording this, there's the looming government shutdown, mm -hmm. which that's probably a little bit higher of our priority right now. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's what we're looking at currently. That that's the current environment. So there's not really much going on other than trying to resolve that issue. I think. Um, but you know, we feel that there is an appetite for some tax legislation uh, between uh, the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. And but it's that you got to go across aisles. There's going to have to be some some compromise to get anything. And we know that the Democrats are really focused on the, the expired child tax credit, trying to get uh, that extended. We know that um, the Republicans are, are very concerned with some of the, the expiring provisions of, of the Trump tax cuts. So we're talking like R and D cost amortization, bonus depreciation, things like that. Um, so there's going to have to be a compromise, and and if a compromise can be reached across those things, then we have the potential for some tax legislation that then some opportunity zones legislation could could be inserted into, and you know potential timing, you know, maybe November December. We really see have to see how things how things progress at this point. Um, since it's such a big cloud right now over DC with 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 the potential shutdown. Well, fingers crossed we can get through the shutdown and then hopefully toward year end we do get some big tax legislation bill that opportunity zones can can kind of um hitch on to, so to speak. Uh we'll be tracking that very closely on this podcast and on our website. And I'm sure no regret will be tracking it on their opportunity zones uh, center as well. We'll make sure we link to uh no regret opportunity zone resource center. Uh, from our show notes page today too. Uh, what about on the regulatory side? We just got done talking about legislation, but what about um, Treasury, the IRS, how they're regulating opportunity zones? Final regulations have been in place now for a few years, but there's always little tweaks here and there. Are there any priorities that you're tracking on that side of things? Absolutely. Uh, one of the big questions right now is around QAF decertifications. We get questions on a daily basis from QAFs that are wondering, well, how do I go about the process? My my deal didn't make it um, for whatever reason. I wanted to decertify my QAF, and I'd like to not have to pay a lot of penalties for, <laughs> to do that. And so we, we're getting questions all the time. That is an ongoing regulatory project. It's, it's included in uh, the regulatory agenda. Uh, currently, those quality certifications. Currently, um, I think December of 23 is when the proposed timeline is for a, a notice of proposed rulemaking around uh, quality certification. But that's been ongoing. Um, it's it's it was, previously, I believe it was August of 23, and before that, it was June of 22. It, this has been a, a, an ongoing project, I think, for for Treasury. Uh, there's also the expectation that there will be final regulations uh, around the proposed regulations that were introduced around foreign taxpayers. Um, and these, that's the same regulation that added the um, the additional time uh, regarding the working capital uh, safe harbor stuff um, mm -hmm. around federally declared disasters that, that gave that. Um, some additional language of that. So we're expecting that to be finalized. Currently, I think May of 24 is when that is uh, on the docket for the schedule, but we'll see if that updates. And you know, there have been some other projects that the, the, the Opportunity Zones Working Group, you know, sponsored by Novogratic, has been involved in. We've been trying to get more guidance around working capital safe harbor plans, and we submitted a letter uh, this past year with a, a bunch of recommendations uh, for how the working capital safe harbor plan um, and the written schedules around that could be modified to, to to help it make more sense to investors. There's this very strict sort of rule now where the only way you can really change your working capital plan is if there's a federally declared disaster, which, yeah, those happen. But um, I think for, for general business reasons, there are lots of lots of reasons that a working capital safe harbor plan may need to change. Business plans change. And so we've been trying to get some additional guidance around that. and. 
we'll see that it's been submitted. Uh, we've, we've had acknowledgement from Treasury that they've re received our recommendations and we'll see what happens. Oh, very good. We'll be tracking that as well. Uh, Brent, I want to turn to you now, give you a chance to uh, uh, take the stage here. Uh, we were discussing how the opportunity zone industry, Jason mentioned how, how opportunity zones has kind of exceeded expectations in terms of uh, investment deployed into these different locations all over the country. Novogratz provides an incredible service to the industry with its quarterly survey data updates. You guys are surveying over a thousand different QOFs now on a rolling voluntary basis, a kind of an unofficial tally of uh, what is taking place in the Opportunity Zones industry. What's the latest update on the volume and pacing of capital raising among the QOFs that Novogratz tracks? That's right. Um, so, you know, as, uh, as Jason sort of mentioned earlier, um, 2023 not as strong as you know 2022 and in prior years, but uh, still still healthy investment. Uh, quarter two latest information. Quarter two and we're going to have quarter three out pretty soon. Uh, but at quarter two uh, saw of the funds we track, which is about a quarter to a third of, of all funds, I think a little over a thousand funds, like you said. Um, there was 1.33 billion of investment in Q2 uh, 2023. Um, for the year, a uh, little over two billion. So uh, quarter one was pretty anemic, coming off a, a strong 2022. Um, but you know, hopefully, we're hopeful that you know, especially with uh, new legislation uh, being introduced, we'll see you know some healthy investment um, when the year sort of starts to round out. Um, you know, within that, and that sort of brings the total invested of the funds again that we track to 36.1 billion. Um, so, you know, like Jason said, I mean, just far beyond like, you know, any expectations, I think originally, um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I think we're seeing, you know, uh, we're seeing, you know, healthy investment in, in, you know, geographically, you know, throughout the country. Um, you know, I think it's, it's actually leading in sort of California, obviously it's, you know, it's a bigger footprint. But uh, but Los Angeles in particular is uh, is sort of the the leading city, uh, which investments um, you know found um, by by a healthy margin, which is interesting because you know there's no California conformity. But um, but you know multifamily continues to and in particular residential continues to sort of you know outpace other other investments, um, followed by. Uh, followed by commercial, hospitality, you know, we're seeing a lot of renewables and, and especially lately. Uh, now, I think as, you know, going back to what you were asking about earlier and talking about sort of the trend of the industry and, and you know, how things are progressing, um, I think we're seeing, you know, at least personally, I'm seeing a lot of interesting sort of deals happening and master plans and everything being developed that include, you know, these other tax credits. Uh, low income housing tax credits, renewables, historics, you know, everything sort of, uh, you know, I was just at a, a, I was just at a client's, visiting several clients in Salt Lake City and uh, just all types of great stuff happening there. So I think, you know, there is a little bit of a, a there's a little bit of a, a, a downtick in, in the investment. So hopefully that starts to kind of pick up again. Uh, but I think there's still a lot of development happening out there and it's continuing to sort of bloom. So. Good stuff happening. Yeah, I agree. Good stuff happening. Uh, like I mentioned a few minutes earlier, some macroeconomic or cyclical headwinds that uh, private markets and opportunity zones specifically for the purposes of this podcast are, are kind of heading into, unfortunately. Um, uh, the fundraising or capital raising volume down significantly year over year from Q2 of last year to Q2 of this year. But it's ticking back up from Q1 to Q2 this year. You had a little bit of an uptick in the uh, in the acceleration of capital raising, and hopefully we see some good data from Q3 when when that gets released here in in a couple more weeks. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but a uh, lot 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 to consider. A lot we're tracking here with the opportunity zones industry. Jason, I want to turn back to you now. Uh, we talked about our, the current legislation that just got introduced this morning. Um, I want to talk with you about what's on the roadmap beyond this iteration of legislation, looking out to, you know, for uh, future years down the road here for Opportunity Zones, the Novogratic 
Opportunity Zone Working Group has put out some ideas for what could be thought of as an OZ 2.0. Uh, can you share some of those high level details of what a 2.0 version of Opportunity Zones might look like? Sure, be happy to. Yeah, we our, our members have spent some time sort of brainstorming. Yeah, if we had another bite at the apple, if we if we could redesign some of the aspects of, of the Opportunity Zone Center, what will we do? What could we do to drive even more investment in, into these lower income areas? What, what could we do to maybe direct and focus investment on some necessary things like job creation and affordable housing? Um, what what else could be done? So first off, first and foremost. You know, we're like you said, we're looking out into the future at this point. Probably nothing that can happen even in this Congress is very unlikely to be a major tax legislation in an election year 2024. Uh, we already talked about the challenges for 2023. So the 118th Congress is probably not going to have major tax legislation. So we're going out to the next Congress at this point. Uh, so we're talking 119th Congress, so 2025-26. So you know, first and foremost, we'd like to see permanence. That's that's everybody's wish. A two-year extension is great. We'd love to see permanence. I mean, clearly, this incentive works. It drives investment. So if, if, in order to get that permanence, what can we do to sort of respond to some of the criticisms that the, the incentive has gotten, which is, well, it's not creating uh, affordable housing. Well, maybe we could expand the incentive. Uh, to provide some additional benefits for investments that are sort of curated and targeted towards affordable housing and and job creation. Um, you know, we've discussed, you know, what would it take? What would the incentive need to be for an investor to maybe forego some of the return uh, from market rate housing and maybe focus on affordable housing? And so maybe, you know, we're thinking along the lines of a 50% exclusion rather than the maximum 15% exclusion of capital gains. So it, we're saying a capital gain that can be invested. If 50% of that was to be tax free after a certain whole period, then perhaps that would be enough to focus investment and get investors more interested in some of the more impact type investing. Um, so there would still be a, a commensurate re re return for doing that type of investment. So it, it would encourage folks. Um, you know, with the permanence, we, we think there should be regularly scheduled redesignations of opportunity zones. You know, we've talked to a lot of funds. We talked to a lot of other folks too, and we're hearing that a lot of the more readily available, uh, easy to, to complete projects are, are, have been done in opportunity zones. And so we're starting to run into an issue where it's getting more and more difficult to locate a project that makes sense. So maybe it's time, or at least within the next few years, it's time to let's redesignate and let's get some new, some new census tracts onto the list in order to start kind of start the process over and drive new investment into other areas as we know only 25 percent of of qualifying census tracts can be nominated so there's still 75 percent of census tracts that meet the criteria to be nominated as opportunity zones out there so maybe it's time to to consider redesignating and then having a rolling six-year deferral period we think rather than this you know right now and this this was because of of, of how the incentive had to be passed to begin with, but we had this hard December 31st, 2026 deadline. And so the closer we get to that, the fewer and fewer benefits there have been for investors. The 10% and 5%, that went away in 2021. Um, so we, we, we've we lost a lot of that uh, incentive to encourage investment. So we think in a permanence type setting, let's, let's just make it a six year. So if you hold your investment for six years, you qualify for the, the 15%. Um, tax-free portion of, of your originally deferred gain. Um, some other ideas we've had is extending the reinvestment rule to the Quasby level. So a Quaf that receives uh, proceeds back from, a, from an investment, they can reinvest it and continue the gain. But a Quasby can't. If a Quasby sells property, it the gain on the sale of that property, if it's before a 10-year hold, is fully taxable. And that has really discouraged a lot of folks that don't want to necessarily hold on to the same investment for 10 years. If you gave a Quasby at the Quasby level, gave them the ability to develop a property, sell it, take those proceeds, kind of like a 1031 at this point, right? Um, take those proceeds, invest them into a new and keep that deferral process going. I, I think you could greatly increase the amount of investment because that 10 year hold um, is a long time. 
it's a long time for real estate. It's an infinity for operating businesses. Um, so to give, we feel like to give that ability to flip investments might attract more VC capital at that point in private equity uh, in operating businesses. Um, we have a lot of other ideas too. Uh, there's, there's a lot of issues around related party acquisitions that could be fixed, um, especially if the if the ultimate intent, which is to drive investment and drive um, new capital into opportunity zones, if that's the ultimate goal, then the fact that some small portion of an investment was acquired from a related party shouldn't matter. Um, and so there's some modifications that could be done to fix things like that, that would certainly bring many, many more potential projects into the fold. Well, I think that is the goal at the end of the day. Let's get more private capital invested in these underinvested areas. That's the whole point of Opportunity Zones in the first place. The 1.0 is pretty good. It's got some flaws. Uh, the incentives have expired. Some of the incentives have expired permanently. Some of them are going to expire uh, by the end of 2026 if Congress doesn't take action. So we've got two big pieces, uh, big, two big moving pieces right now. One is this initial reform and extension legislation that we're, fingers crossed, hoping gets passed uh, by the end of this year. And then uh, Jason was just recapping their vision for the next version of Opportunity Zones, Opportunity Zones 2.0, which would get packaged into some sort of bill probably in uh, in 25 or, or 26 in the next session of Congress, still a few years out. But I love the ideas. I love the ambition of, of, of you know, being able to say, hey, look, First of all, here's the reporting on Opportunity Zones 1.0. This is clearly working. It's driving capital investment, private capital investment into these areas that typically have not received it. Here have been the benefits. Here's been the economic activity in these areas. Here's how it's benefited the residents of these areas. Let's make this bigger and better. Let's improve the incentive. Let's make it permanent. Fingers crossed this all works out. Uh, time will tell, but I, I, I love that you guys have already roadmapped a lot of these ideas so you can kind of hit the ground running once uh, we put the presidential election behind us, once we get that new session of Congress seated uh, at the beginning of 2025. Um, one more big thing I forgot. Yes, that, please. Um, is we would like to see that when the taxpayer's tax bill comes due on the deferred gain, we really feel like it needs to be at the rate, at the capital gains tax mm -hmm. rate, in place at the time they deferred the gain, because that is a huge unknown. And we, you, you never know how the winds of Washington are going to go. And if, if capital gains tax rates suddenly shoot up um, with, with a new administration, perhaps in, in the, you know 24, whatever happens there, we don't know. Um, if capital gains rates increase greatly, then that could really effectively punish folks that yeah. invested into these low-income areas. by They defer to gain at 20% and they have to pay out at 37% or 39.6% or something. It's uh, It would be terrible. So we'd, we'd like to see that be part of any continuing uh, permanency. Uh, absolutely. I love that idea that, yeah, that would be a rather unpleasant tax bill that you find coming due in April of 2027. Uh, I suppose increased capital gains though, the, the, the two-edged sword, it does it does kind of hurt you in, in April 2027 when you have to pay the deferred gain uh, liability, but it makes the incentive overall more valuable is what I tell people because hey right. you get to you get to exclude exactly. right yeah exactly. the, the higher speaking your language the more value there is in deferring payment on it so exactly exactly uh well let's let's kind of wrap up our conversation today by discussing this upcoming opportunity zones conference Brent I'm going to turn back to you you're the conference chair of the Novogradic 2023 fall opportunity zone summit which is coming to Washington, D.C., the Park Hyatt in Washington, D.C., on November 1st. Brent, what are you looking forward to the most, and what should attendees expect out of this conference? Uh, so I think the, the whole, it's a, it's a, it's a one-day event. Um, but I think the, the whole day is just packed. It's, it's, it's a great day. Um, and I don't know about you, Jason, uh, but I'm really looking forward to the whole day. I think it's, uh, we've got a lot of, we've got all-star cast. Um, stack lineup. Uh, we're running from you know, opening address uh, and Washington report where you know we're gonna see, we're gonna hear the latest. Uh, obviously, there's gonna be a lot that happens before then, um, and so we'll hear everything that's that's you know the latest at that point. 
um, and you know from the people that are sort of drafting and introducing these bills. So uh, so from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So so I'm really excited about the Washington report. Um, and then, you know, the next panel we have is going to be our, our fun sponsors panel, which is called Quaffy Talk. <laughs> um, I love, uh, I love the title is, of that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, uh, it, it is an afternoon. So, you know, it's, it's an afternoon coffee, but, um, but, but yeah, at Jason's actually moderating that panel. So, uh, so you'll hear, uh, Jason and, and some fantastic fun sponsors, uh, professionals, uh, administrator jtc is going to be on there so uh great stuff and then uh the last two panels of the day consist of a, a technical topics uh panel which is going to include you know all types of sort of complicated stuff that that you know people are facing uh you know such as sort of 1031 exchanges uh regulatory compliance etc um and then a, a hot topics panel um which is going to get into sort of various uh developing like investor trends um issues related to sort of emerging investment activity, uh, one of which I think they're going to talk about the, the clean energy and, and efficient uh, building uh, provisions of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is which is massive. And, and so I think we're going to see, we're seeing a lot of synergy already between the incentive and that. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, uh, not to uh, not to ignore the it's going to be followed by a mix of or so. Uh, so you all get together, have some drinks, and uh, and talk about the day. Uh, and then and then actually, what's what's cool about this is the next two days um, we're going to have our renewable energy tax credit conference in the same hotel uh, on the second and third. Um, so so you know stick around for that. Um, there's going to be all types of people to talk to. Um, you know various uh, uh, levels of of uh, various different stakeholders, um, fund sponsors. Uh, we're going to see, you know, just all types of different stakeholders. And so I think it's it's really exciting. I'm excited about the whole thing and I'm staying through, you know, through Friday. So uh, so I definitely urge everybody to uh, to check that out. No, that's great. Like I always say, come for Opportunity Zone, stay for Renewable Energy Tax Credits. I don't know if I always yeah. say that, but I'll say no, it in this it. circumstance. <laughs> uh, I'm really looking forward to the conference. I'm going to be there. So if uh, I would say if you are any sort of opportunity zone stakeholder, whether you're a CPA or an attorney, or you're a uh, qualified opportunity fund manager, maybe you're a real estate developer or a deal sponsor, maybe you're an investor or an advisor. If you're interested in learning more about opportunity zones or networking with some of the most important people and most influential people in the industry, I highly recommend the Novograd conference. I never miss one of these. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, Opportunity DB is a media partner with Novogratic on this event. Uh, we do have a special coupon code that I can share with you. If you want to save 10%, my podcast listeners can save 10% by entering Opportunity DB10. That's Opportunity DB10 at checkout uh, when you go purchase your conference tickets. And uh, I mean, best part, you get to meet the three of us there and a lot of other professionals in the industry. It's a really good time. That hot topics panel, uh, you're saving the that 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 one uh, for last. That sounds like an interesting one. That's like the dessert for the day, I would say. And then uh, you get your cocktail hour right after that. And then uh, I don't know, I might have to round up some people and take them out to dinner that night as well. I'm really looking forward to it, gentlemen. Um, thank you both so much today for coming on the show and sharing your insights on legislation, on regulatory updates. Uh, again, great timing with the breaking news about uh, that that bill being introduced just uh, within the last couple of hours here. We'll be talking a lot more about that on this show in future episodes. I'm sure there will be plenty of discussion on that legislation at the Novogratic Conference in Washington, D.C. on November 1st. Before we go, can you tell our audience where they can go to learn more about Novogratic and the upcoming event? Yeah, so, uh, so you know, go to uh, www.novoco.com, N-O-V-O-C-O.com. And uh, all types of information there. Um, yeah, check it out. Perfect. And uh, I'll make sure to link to Novaco.com. I'll also link to their Opportunity Zone Resource Center. It's it's, it's great. It's packed with uh, tons of information and, and regular updates. And I'll also link directly to where you can buy tickets for the upcoming conference. And again, that coupon code you can use is OpportunityDB10. Uh, my podcast listeners can... Save 10%. Uh, thank you to Novogratic for 
providing me with the opportunity to share that with my listeners and for our listeners and viewers. Of course, as always, we'll have show notes available for today's episode. You can find those show notes at opportunitydb.com slash podcast. I'll have links to all of the resources that Jason, Brent, and I discussed on today's episode. And please be sure to also subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform to always get the latest episodes. Jason and Brent, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again so much for joining me today. And I'll see you November 1st in DC. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Jimmy. My pleasure.